Okay, our, okay, our third speaker this morning, uh, you know well, Dr. Eva Harris, professor uh, in the Division of Infectious Disease and the School of Public Health, and the director of the Center for Global Public Health at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Dr. Harris's work. Uh, she's been working uh, particularly in Nicaragua for uh, over 28 years, a host of uh, infectious disease issues, particularly dengue, Zika, influenza. Um, so a pr very prestigious researcher, activist, practitioner, um, and a wonderful colleague, I should note. Uh, she, in 97, received the MacArthur Award for her work um, and uh, founded also a nonprofit uh, called Sustainable Science Institute uh, to further the work and the collaborations between scientists uh, and community members. Dr. Harris. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Great. So um, now I have to live up to that introduction. <laughs> okay, so what I'd like to do today is um, give you a piece, a vision on and the concept of engaging communities and how we've tried to approach that in the area of um, our virus, especially in 80s born diseases, and thrillingly had a nice introduction by Steve Lindsay already on this. So, um, I am the mandate that I was given um, were three sets of questions, and I'm going to try and address them through the examples that I'm going to give today. So, the first was to look at what are effective community based interventions and participatory approaches to prevent and control infectious diseases in urban areas, what elements should be considered. Um, it's for it to be successful and what are pitfalls, how can we ensure sustainability, and then to what extent are there surveillance methods that can capture accurate and precise data in real time, um, and how has this information been used to target, to tar develop policies, and how can communities help with this? And so what I'm, I'm going to do is, is use our experience with um, a pilot study that led to a large cluster randomized control trial and then where that's going now um, to illustrate this and try and touch on all of these points. Um, so we have a mosquito problem. Um, this is downloaded from the internet, but you know everyone gets upset about shark attacks, and um, I get upset about like human violence against each other. And in fact, it's the mosquito which is actually killing more numbers per year um, than anyone else. Um, and this is just an example of the 80s uh, problem, and you can see the very wide distribution. Um, across the entire globe, of course, there's anopheles, mosquitoes for malaria, et cetera. And I'm just going to focus on this particular example. Um, so it's been recognized for a long time that essentially what we, the current vector control strategies fail time and time again. Um, because as you saw from uh, Dr. Lindsay's talk, there's just increasing numbers of dengue, uh, cases of dengue and it's spreading worldwide. And the traditional manners have um, essentially focused on chemical control for the most part, um, both fumigation and this temifos, which is a chemical which is essentially a larvicide put into um, household water. Um, it's actually not <laughs> really approved for use in, at all in potable water, but yet it's in household water, which often gets onto you know, drinking plates, et cetera. So there's a big health risk for both the temifos piece and then the fumigation with asthma and others. But we kind of don't, unfortunately, there's not enough discussion of that, and I'm not going to go there. But what we use does help have like uncharacterized health effects and it doesn't work. Um, and so for a long time, there's been this concept of the involving communities. And so um, for, it's the concept of involving communities has been around, but there's been a kind of a bias against, against it in the sense that people feel it hasn't been shown to be productive or to work or to be quantified or to be measured or to be impactful. And so the problem has been that there's a concept of involving community, but like how that really looks and how you quantify it has not been recognized. So um, for a while, the, this kind of concept of you know, the effectiveness of having communities in dengue control programs is weak. But recently, there has been a shift into the concept that, in fact, communities can be involved and it actually can be productive. And there's a, a new set of kind of meta reviews that have kind of come to the conclusion um, that, you know, in, that when interventions use a community-based integrated approach, which is tailored to local epidemiology and social cultural settings combined with educational programs, this is actually the best practice. So the question there is, okay, but then how do you actually make that happen? How do you engage and motivate the communities to make that really effective? Um, and so th I'm just going to talk about our work, but I want to put it in the larger context of a number of different approaches, what I call variations on a theme of community-based participatory research. And this is a series of different um, 
initiatives that have been taking place over the past five to ten years. I'm going to go very briefly, not into them, I just want to give credit where credit is due, that there are other groups working in this field. And so one was the TDR took this on through this eco-biosocial concept. And they actually um, had a program from 2006 to 2011 that it was a, com a competition for grants both in dengue and in Chagas, both vector-borne diseases, both in Latin America and in Asia, and they supported a number of groups and led to um, a kind of new approaches um, specified by each country about how to put this together and then ended up with a number of articles and, and special volumes and moving forward with those groups. The Pan American Health Organization for a long time now has been pushing this concept of the ejidengue, which is a estrategia de gestión integrada, which is essentially not just one thing or, you know, like a clinical aspect or this or that, but really seeing the whole thing together. And a very important part of it has been the social communication aspect of that, which is part of the integrated approach. Um, there's a, a long series of work which has been done in Cuba in a much more kind of structured format in collaboration with Patrick van der Stroop, and he and um, Cuban uh, investigators have done an, uh, some uh, um, RC random control trials and have really brought the community into using the kind of more standard vector control strategies, but with community involvement in a more vertical approach, but that has been effective. And then there was the approach that we took, which was called the Camino Verde, which is what I'm going to talk about more, that led to a very large cluster randomized control trial in 85,000 people in two countries. And has, I it's kind of been looked at as a somewhat of a landmark in a study in this, or trial, in the sense that it actually really quantified in like the RCT methodology that this stuff can work. And what I want to talk about is how does that work and how do we take that from you know, a trial out into the future. Um, and where the future is leading is kind of taking the, the con concepts that were defined by that 10 or 15 years of work and then bringing it, combining it with a technology tool to allow capture of real time data for both the community itself to measure how are we doing and have, be motivated by their own progress and to make that information available for reports and for countries, country level analysis. And that's combined with another group approach called the care groups, which essentially all of it is, this, is a methodology where you have facilitators that then work with brigadistas in the communities, which then work with individual households and residents. And so that way you get um, kind of, you start with a few, you know, 100 and you get to 50,000 people that you're working with directly. And so um, the way we approached it with the Camino Verde was using a methodology that was um, developed by a group called See It, which is a nonprofit organization that we worked with for the last 15 or so years. And they had developed an epidemiological um, framework and methodology that had been used in 50 different countries over 30 years um, to measure and to bring community uh, essentially data into their voice into policy. Um, and, but then the, we added this level called socializing evidence for participatory action and applied that to the dengue problem. And a lot of this issue is really about how do you engage and motivate the community. And the best way to do it is with their own evidence. So what had been shown is that messaging and going to communities and saying, okay, here are three simple messages, guys. Yeah, da, 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 da. You know, no, it's like it's their own data, their own evidence. They find larvae in their own water and they figure out how they're going to solve the problem. And when that happens, that's when it really works because they are involved and they're engaged in the knowledge and in their own solution to their problem. And so what we found is that, again, this is the famous 80s mosquito, which thankfully Dr. Lindsay already explained. And the issue is that it, it, it grows, it breeds in clean water around people's homes. So this whole issue about water management that we, we've been discussing, um, you know, in piped water, intermittent water, you know, you have barrels, you have rainwater, you don't have good garbage collection, all this stuff about urbanization in tropical cities is just cabal. It's like right on top of the dengue problem because the 80s are just right in with the behavioral ecology of the 21st century. And so we have different levels of, of intervention at the house, at the barrio or the neighborhood, and then between the barrios. And the issue is that, okay, so here's this messaging idea, right? It's the mosquito, get rid of the mosquito. Well, you know, it's, it's not the mosquito in the sense that what the interventions that are public health people are telling people to do is, you know, dump out your water, clean the water, get rid of the water, and no one mentioned the mosquito. So why would you be motivated to do all of these actions? You're tired, it's hot, you've got 10 kids. I mean, why, why would you come and start like scrubbing barrels? Like there's no logic. And when we started working, we said, what do you need to know? And they were like, 
you know, we need the knowledge. This is the life cycle. So the click was the life cycle and having people understand the mosquito life cycle. Because in fact, if you understand that you have eggs and then larva and then pupa, and then that leads to mosquitoes and it takes whatever, about eight days, 10 days for it to become the whole mosquito, you don't have to be running around every single day looking for larva. You do it once a week and you cortar el ciclo de vida. You cut the life cycle of the, deng of the dengue mosquito. And you only need to do it once a week. And you can do it by yourself. You actually don't need pesticides. You don't need chemicals. And that was the Camino Verde, the green part of this, was that it was not dependent on chemicals, because you just eliminate the breeding sites. And that's how yellow fever was controlled for the Panama Canal. That's what it was, source reduction. And you don't need chemicals. You just need to eliminate the breeding site. And so the idea was that you can do it with the, with the fingers is por si solo. You can do it by yourself every eight days, and that makes sense to people. So what do they do? Well, you know, it was mentioned getting like removing tires. Tires are people's property, you know? And so coming in and saying, give me your tires, that's junk, or get rid of this old shoe, it's junk, that's offensive, you know? And people might want to do something with those tires. And when they understand the reason why, you know, rainwater is in tires this way and this way and this way, so what do you do? You fill it with dirt. So you make, you know, this is, this is like all lolo, so it's all mud when it rains. No, now you have a stairway made of tires. You have bridges made of tires. You have you know, plants, as yerba buena, chiltoma, you know, in tires. That, that's got rid of the tire problem. But if no one in like Geneva or Atlanta actually came up with that idea because they're not living in that situation. You know, so then you have barrio level inter interventions because, you know, there's pe things that are not in people's homes. There's you know, lots between homes, there's bus stations, there's businesses. What do you do when all of your breeding, you know, the mosquitoes fly, right? So you, know, you can have a brilliant, you know, your house is really nice, and then next, next door is where all the mosquitoes are coming from. So you need to engage community, businesses, et cetera, barrio fairs, the schools. I mean, there's just, I mean, it's cool. These are the larvae, and you look at them, and they're really cool. And it, it, you know, it's interesting for, for kids to get involved. So that's like a major driver as well. Cleanup campaigns, et cetera. So the way this worked in this um, cycle was that we did this observational study, which was um, cycles initially of evidence gathering, entomology, like essentially knowledge behavior, and then measuring the amount of anti-dengue antibodies in children's saliva, which was a non-invasive approach to actually look at infection rates. Um, because you wanted to move it, as Don Scott was saying, out of just the entomology into a more epidemiological outcome. Um, and so this was not dengue itself, because it was all involving health centers, blah, 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 but it was looking at dengue infection, which is actually really important, because it can put you at risk for more severe infection. Even if you have an asymptomatic infection, you're still at greater risk. So measuring infection is actually really important. And we did that with paired samples before and after the epidemic, and looking at an increase in antibody titers. And so that was done. And then the point is that we brought all that back directly to the community. And then they came up with their control strategies, their communication strategies, and their activities. And then we refined that over four years every time. That then led to a bunch of lessons, um, which we then used to be the, the, to be the basis of this cluster randomized control trial. And the concept or the key lessons was the critical role of evidence and reflection with residents that the risk is in their own home, they can control the vector in their own environment, and integrated neighborhood action is really critical. Socialization and dialogue about the evidence can generate interventions also from a cost-benefit point of view because they're actually spending a lot of money on coils and this and that, you know, and when you actually add that up, it's like, wow, we actually have invent, invest, invented, invested a lot as individuals and as a community that we could actually do something like make a cancha de basketball or something that we, you know, it, we're doing something that's not working. And when you add it up, you have a cost benefit driver as well. Um, beyond the motivation, the idea is that the communities and the households res assume responsibility for their own health. And that's a very kind of empowering approach. And then the external actions. Um, really are generated from the knowledge and the experience of the communities, but it's not a one-size-fits-all. Like, every community is a vast microcosm. You know, it's just, everything's different, everyone, but, but there are certain principles. So you don't come and say, do this and this and this. You say, this is the evidence, these are the concepts, and then it is translated into action in a way that makes sense for every community. And it, and it requires that the community, it has to materialize organically. It's really important that the autonomy and the the motivation come from the, from the people, the, 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 the brigadas who come from those communities and their residents. So that led to this trial. Um, and so we did Nicaragua and Mexico, um, about 85,000 residents together, a very urban environment, which had a tradition of community um, 
movement, essentially community organization. And so people said, ah, you can do anything in Nicaragua. Everyone you know, gets involved. And we said, OK, well, we'll try Mexico. Um, and this was in Acapulco, which at the time you know, was like couldn't be more different. It was in the middle of like, the narco-terrorist crisis. And I mean, talk about you know, no communication, I mean, I mean, no social fabric, terrible. And then also in rural areas. And then we looked again at serology, um, entomology, and reports, self-reported dengue, double randomization, interventions, impact measurement. And essentially what we found is that we had about a 30% decrease in the serological indicators, 25% um, decrease in the self-reported cases, and then a bunch of, you know, 35 to 50% decrease in entomological indices. And this was across both countries. Um, what was really interesting is that, again, we found this 25% um, protective factor from the intervention, but we also found that Temafos, um, which is that, our, that larvicide, actually increased the risk, increased the risk of dengue. And we thought, well, maybe that's because when you have a dengue case, it's, it's notified to the Ministry of Health. The Ministry of Health comes in and puts Avate, puts Temafos. And so we did only the houses that, that had no dengue case, um, and we still found that same increase in risk. And, that's be, and we'll talk about why, because I'm running out of time. <laughs> um, we also saw this not just in one time, but over seven years of measurements. We saw the exact same story that you got a decrease in, essentially, um, when, when we have the intervention and an increase in risk when we have this ap application of Temafos, and we can talk about that in the discussion. One thing I want to mention, though, is that the added value is that it's really about social mobilization. And so, you know, there's all these great elements about bringing gang members in, et cetera, but they also, this, the, the communities are mobilized so that if they went in, they actually were able to go and get sewer lines p placed in, in because of going and counting the number of barrels and presenting that to the alcaldía, the mayor's office, and then gay stuff, you know, and then attacking things like domestic violence and, so, and sexual violence. So it's just a platform for mobilizing the community above and beyond. Dengue is the banner, but it actually is much more important for the community and other issues. So. The, the next piece of where I'm going to end is kind of the, where this has gone and, and uh, taking the same concepts and then adding it to a technology tool which captures in real time um, data from mapping the communities, household surveys, SES data, and then real time crowdsourced community entomology. And it's also based on a game theory. So it's all about this life cycle, but the, the, essentially it's picked up in a cell phone. Um, and then what we do is it, it, it's, there's a web-based system and a cell phone-based system, which allows for communication and dialogue and a blog for kids that are involved in this. But it also has all of the data at the minutia level of the households that can actually be used for their own selves and then for other, for, you know, essentially information for data. And essentially the concept is that you find a criadero or a breeding site, you take a picture, you document it, and then you get points for eliminating it. But as you, and so it's, and as you do that, you actually map the real information onto the website. But you're actually physically getting rid of the thing. So that you have these, de these dengue warriors, you know, los al dengue, los blacks of dengue, et cetera. And they're, they're competing against each other, not individually, but as a community. And so that's a really important concept. But that as, they're, so they're, it's a virtual, but it's also real because they're getting rid of the breeding sites as they do this. And that's how they get points. It's also a blog. It's also about bringing evidence. You know, the kids, these are like cyber cafes set up in people's homes that they can help also now use, they do homework, they da da da, they bring, so it's like a whole new concept in technology. They're mapping again this red, yellow, green story, but this is the, the free houses and this is the houses going down that are at risk. You see it mapping and to where this is, and all this is publicly available. And it actually works, so this is over time. When you have the pupa per container, the Breteau index, which measures larva, you can see that the intervention values go down and stay down. And this is both in the wet season and the dry season. And the, the paid project actually ended here. But the, the, the brigadas kept on by themselves and actually kept down the levels and compared, you can see, to the, inter the reference communities, um, which were much, much higher. So where this is going, it, it started. And really, Josefina Coloma, who works with me, has been one who's taken it. And I'm ending now. You know, in Brazil and Mexico, it's really been explo exploding in Nicaragua um, through some AID funding and working directly with the Ministry of Health in Colombia and Paraguay now, um, and moving it towards policy. Uh, and it, it's now been taken up, the concept with, from the, the Inter-American Development Bank, and there's some interest in moving it into other countries. We're talking with PAHO, and this is my final slide, that it's really, it's beyond a game to community action, um, and it involves not just community participation, but data generation, which is really critical. Um, there's a tension between vertical and horizontal programs because you, you need some place to house it, but for it to really work, it has to be horizontal. 
And so how do you make that happen? And so it's really not just the Ministry of Health, but it's the Alcaldías, it's the community organizations. And so that's kind of the tricky part, but there is a way to make those two work together. Um, it has to be integrated and intersectorial, as we've discussed, in a complex integrated model. And evidence is really the critical aspect to you know, essentially making it successful and then both scaling it up and scaling it out. Um, and so with that, I'd like to end. Uh, thank the folks in CIT, um, in Nicaragua, in the Ministry of Health, uh, especially Josefina Coloma, who's really been you know, just the, the banner leader for all of, of this in the next phase, um, sustainable sciences, and our people, and you. So thanks very much. <laughs>